Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you about Chilling, the scary stories app that I'm a narrator on, which very soon will become Chilling 2.0, a full-fledged platform which will include video content in addition to the stories. Full-length horror films, series, and exclusive Chilling originals are just some of what Chilling 2.0 is bringing to horror fans. It's crafted by horror fans for horror fans. Download now and start your free trial to see if you like it. There are so many popular narrators on Chilling, and over a thousand stories, with hours more being added every single week. Lastly, Chilling is now accepting investments from the public, and investors are taking notice. You can get in on it now before the shares are projected to increase in value greatly. Don't miss out. Chilling is a must-have app for horror story lovers, and Chilling 2.0 will change the game completely. The links to download and check out the investment page are in the description. Welcome back to the swamp my friends. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true and disturbing horror stories that I've read over the past couple of weeks on the Swamp Dweller Horror Stories channel. If you guys enjoyed these stories be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true disturbing horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. When I was 17 years old, I went to a party a few years back. Everything was alright until the host started getting intense and creepy. By that point, it was around 3am and I was drunk. I decided to call an Uber to avoid the insistent guy's advances. The Uber shows up and I try to sober up when I get in. The driver started making small talk with me and in the state I was in, I failed to see the red flags. He began to ask me about the party I was at, and I told him about the creep, and then he told me it was because I was short and cute. He then asked me about my age, and sensing a weird vibe from him I told him I was a minor, thinking that would deter any further advances, but it turns out that was a horrible idea. He was driving pretty recklessly on the highway, and I snapped out of my drunken stupor real fast. He then asked me to get some drinks with him that same night and told me he liked me. I quickly told him I'd get grounded if I stayed out any later and that my mother was awake and waiting for me to get home. Keep in mind I lived in Mexico at the time and the amount of people, especially women that get murdered daily is ridiculously high. When we got to my home address I noticed the doors were locked and he kept on insisting on us going to get a drink even though by now it was almost 4am. I tried to act as pleasant as possible when I told him I could not remember that night. He then asked for my phone number and told me we could go out the next day. So, not being the first time that some creep has asked me for my number, I gave him my number but changed the last digit so he couldn't contact me. Still, he dialed the phone as I got out of the car. Of course my phone did not ring and he started to get agitated and said I gave him the wrong number. I played drunk and stupid and recited my number again but said it correctly for him to think he heard the last number wrong. He chuckled and said it was his fault, and he told me we would see each other the next day. I made my way into the house and immediately woke my mother up because I was terrified. She managed to calm me down and told me to go to sleep, so I went into my bedroom and started putting my pajamas on when I heard my phone ring. The Uber driver was trying to video call me and I lost my shit when I saw that on the screen. I immediately denied the call and then noticed he sent me about 15 messages asking what time he could come pick me up and why I wasn't replying. Of course I blocked him right away, and I thought that would be the end of it. The next day I got a text from an unknown number, checked the picture and saw it was the driver. He asked me why I had blocked him and started spamming me. I immediately stopped him. Over the next month I'd be getting messages from random phone numbers, and it quickly became apparent that it was the driver. The Uber driver was just so fixated on stalking me and taking me out. Eventually, I reported him on the Uber app and changed my number. The only problem is, is he knows where I live. Alright, so check this out. I'm not a big fan of Uber. Random people picking you up sounds like a bad idea just waiting to happen. And this experience only confirms my problems. I worked as a bartender in the UK at a pretty popular bar. I always take cabs to and from work as I don't have a car. One night was hectic. 
and cabs were coming and going with people, so many that I couldn't get a hold of one. Desperate, I downloaded Uber and found a driver two minutes away from me. He arrived, and I attempted to open the back door, but it was locked. I looked at the driver, who asked me to open the front passenger door. I found it odd that he wanted me sitting right next to him, but I assumed he had a bunch of crap in the back. Reluctantly, I got into the passenger seat. The man had a thick Russian accent, and part of me considered just speaking Russian to him, but looking back on it now, I'm glad that I kept that ace up my sleeve. Where are you going? He asked aggressively as if I was wasting his time. I told him the address, he plugged it in, and we were on our way. Usually, in these stories, the kidnapper starts following the route and then goes off track once your guard is down. This guy took the first wrong turn that he could. I said, um, this is not the way. Please turn around. I begged him. He said, no, I, I know a shortcut. Except he didn't. I saw his phone, and his turn added four minutes to the drive time. Just then, his phone started ringing with the ID saying, Leova K. He picked up the phone, and that's when I heard the most horrifying call in my life. Yes, yes, the lady is in my car. She suspects nothing. Prep the chains. I'll be there in ten. Make sure everything is ready. We can't leave any remains. We were too sloppy last time. He said all of this in Russian, assuming that I didn't understand. To this day, sometimes I wish that I didn't. I knew I had less than 10 minutes to get out of this situation, or I doubted that I'd ever be seen again. We were approaching a stoplight. I had to formulate a plan quickly. The door was locked, but it was one of those button locks that you could pull out to unlock the door. There was a risk of the man being armed, but I didn't have a choice. Another problem was that he had entered a bad neighborhood, one that was dangerous for a young woman like me walking home alone at night to be in. I decided that after escaping, I would have to order another Uber and just pray it was safe. The light turned yellow, then green, and as the car moved forward, I pulled the button and leapt out of the vehicle. Hey, get back in here, the driver yelled, but I was already running. I didn't expect to hear footsteps behind me, but when I turned back, the driver was chasing after me. He just ditched his car to chase me. I turned down an alley and hid behind this rubbish bin. I heard him run past the alley. I waited hours to hear his footsteps again run past the alley entrance. I left the alley and looked back down the street. The car was gone, but my nerves weren't any better. I was still in a bad neighborhood. I was about to call for another Uber when I wised up. He was probably expecting that I'd do that. He was probably on his phone waiting for the alert. So I began my trek home. I made the whole two hour walk home. I was lucky not to encounter any trouble along the way and as soon as I was back home, I cried. I lived alone, so I didn't feel safe one bit. The Uber driver still had my address. I called the police and I gave them the man's description and the car's make and model. Like a classic horror story idiot, I didn't get the license plate, so they couldn't do much. But they said that they would send an officer to the area. A few weeks later, I was urged to check the internet to see if anything had been done about my complaint. I found an article on a Jane Doe found dead by a riverside. Her hands were chained and a bullet was in her skull. The man, not my Uber driver, charged with the crime told the police of a man named Leova Kesanova who led the entire gang. Nothing ever came up about Leova though. I decided not to come forward with what I knew. I just wanted to return to my life. It's been three years since then and I've been able to move on with my life. I'm happily married and I now manage my bar. I have twins coming in a few months, and for everyone out there who uses Uber, I won't tell you not to use the app, even though I haven't used it since that night, but 
I will ask you to make sure you have the driver's license plate, his description, and the make of his car, and always make sure he stays en route. It may seem like a long and arduous process, but it may just save your life. I'm a 31-year-old female and had to visit the emergency room late at night with my mom last week. She is okay, by the way. Due to COVID and lack of space, no visitors could stay with the patient unless they are an infant. So, I ordered an Uber home as I don't drive. For context, I have severe anxiety, and whenever I'm in an Uber, my fiancé is almost always with me, so I feel safe with him there. The roads of this hospital are a little confusing, and I later found out that my Uber driver was on the other side of the emergency entrance. I was already on edge because it was very late, and that neighborhood was not the safest at the best times. Not long after booking, a car rolls up a ways down from me and calls out a name that sounds like mine, but when you hear them clearly, they're different. So naturally, I walked up and asked if he was my Uber driver. I stated my name and for a moment he looked a bit hesitant and then suddenly and confidently confirmed that he was my driver and was very insistent that I get in the car. I looked at the interior of his car and it didn't have the same setup as a regular Uber. No proper GPS setup, water bottles, check-in code, etc. He also was not wearing a mask at the time which was mandatory for Uber drivers in my country. He kept insisting I get in and when I walked over to check his plates to match the one on the app, he kept loudly telling me to get in the car. Of course, they didn't fit, and as I walked away, he was practically begging me to get in, and got mad when I didn't. My fiancé was on the phone with me the whole time and heard everything, but it was not apparent that I was on a phone call due to my headphones. He ended up driving off, and after five minutes after communicating with my driver, we found each other. I practically broke down as soon as I got in the car, and my Uber driver was so lovely and told me I was competent to make sure everything matched and calmed me down, and that I was surely safe now. I got home with no incident after that and I thanked them profusely and gave them the best 5 star reviews I could. My fiance and I now plan to always turn on location sharing if we ever do something like this again. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone's stories about fake Uber drivers and Swamp Dweller for letting us share this story. Thankfully this story ended well, but others have stuck with me and didn't end nearly as well as mine. I live in Argentina, nowhere exciting or anything that you've probably ever heard of. It's a small town a couple of miles outside of Cordoba. You probably have heard of Cordoba as one of the country's largest cities. My hometown is just far enough that we get many benefits of living close to a big city, but not many of its problems. The only downside is that the small town Argentina life is very conservative, and I am gay. It's not as homophobic as other Latin American nations but becomes pretty dangerous once you get outside the cities. I have a grinder account. Most guys in my town don't use pictures of their faces. They don't want to get exposed to the homophobes in the city. So only after talking to a guy for a while, you exchange selfies. I met this one guy early on, and we hit it off. He was nice, maybe the nicest guy I'd ever met. We started talking in the afternoon and we exchanged selfies by nighttime. We talked all night long. I'm not going to lie to you, I was head over heels for this guy. We made plans to meet later in the week. We were going to meet up at a coffee shop on Thursday afternoon. This seemed normal enough. We both understood that we would have to keep the relationship private and not have any sort of PDA or public display of affection. The coffee shop we were going to meet at was in the nicest part of the town. It had a second floor with a nice balcony with a beautiful view. I got there maybe 20 minutes before we said we would meet. I wanted to build up my nerve and get used to the environment. I was honestly incredibly nervous. This would be the first guy I have ever had a relationship with. I ordered myself a small cup of water to drink as I waited on the balcony. I remember daydreaming a little bit as I sat there. I could view the entrance area to see whoever came in. However, I received a text message. It was the guy I'd been talking to. He told me he was there. I looked down to see four guys walking together. Immediately, I started to panic. I replied to the text message telling him I was in the bathroom. That was when I looked down and noticed that one of their phones had a notification. 
I was suspicious that these guys had come here to attack me. There was an entrance off the balcony onto the side streets. I was about to go down it when I glanced at the four guys. I noticed two of them had baseball bats. That was when I knew I had escaped a severe violent incident. I left and quickly made my way home. It made me anxious because these guys now had my full name and knew what I looked like. They probably even kept the picture of me and posted it online somewhere. I remember straight up freaking out all night. Not only was I highly disappointed by not getting to date someone, but I now had to fear for my life. On some level, I knew that these might be the guys that were trying to pull a prank to be mean or something, but I wasn't sure if that was the case or some sort of violent group of people who wanted to kill me. For the rest of the week, they kept trying to contact me. I blocked him on Grinder, but then he texted me. I stopped his number, but then another one of them texted me, claiming to be the guy's cousin. He kept asking why I stood him up at the coffee shop and wanted to get to know me. I knew this was all just a ploy. I remember one night after the incident, I was walking home bringing my grandmother some things my mom had borrowed. It had been late at night. I'm a procrastinator. It had been a couple of weeks and I knew it wouldn't get done if I didn't do it right then and there that night. But as I was walking home, I noticed a guy following me. He tried to play it off like he had just happened to be walking in the same direction, but I got an extremely uncomfortable feeling from him. I tried looking at him several times to see if I recognized him from the other day, but I didn't get a good look at any of the four guys that came to the coffee shop anyway. It was of no use. I just started to walk faster and faster, but the more I sped up, the more he did. At one point we were jogging. I decided that I had enough of this and would stand my ground. I came to a dead stop and braced myself to fight. I stood there for a few seconds waiting for him to run at me and tackle me, but he just went right by. He didn't even look at me or anything. I was baffled and then it dawned at me that maybe I was being paranoid about everything. Perhaps this guy wasn't following me after all. There were even a couple of times that I got anxious about being watched as I was out in public. Again, they know what I look like and I don't know who they show my picture to. I feel like I'm being watched even to this day. It makes me extremely nervous and sad. One day I'm going to save up enough money and move somewhere I can live my life without fear. The hard part isn't being attacked or ostracized from the local community. The hard part is the fear of waiting for an attack. I'm in a constant state of terror about my sexuality. It's a special kind of fear that very little people know about. And it's also why so many of us fake being straight. But yeah, that was my story about almost brutally being attacked by these homophobic stalkers who might still be hunting me down. I am from Argentina, and my English is not very good, so I used the Google Translator to share my experience, so I'm sorry if something is not well understood. This experience occurred seven years ago on a trip with my elementary school in sixth grade to a hotel in another state where we would stay for a week. To be more exact, this happened on the fourth day. We had just finished dinner, and people who took care of us told us that we had to go to sleep and each group went to their respective room. The rooms were divided into three groups of three boys, and I stayed with two friends in a room that had three beds placed on one next to another. Against the same wall in front of the middle bed where I slept, there was a television on the right side with a closet, and the left side had the bathroom. When we got ready to sleep, my friends forgot the TV control on the top of the table and told me to go manually turn off the TV, and I reluctantly went and turned it off. When I lay down on my bed again, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Something that was inside of the closet. It looked like a face that was stretched out. It was light brown in color, but it was not anything similar to a human being. This thing had no eyes or body and was semi-hidden between the clothes of the closet. If I could even remotely say something that resembles it, it would be that stretched mouth monster that is in the game of amnesia, but without eyes. Before, I did not believe in ghosts or cryptids or anything like that, but although it seemed strange, I ignored it. I thought it was a pile of poorly ordered clothes that looked like a face or what I imagined a face due to the fatigue. I went to sleep and after covering myself with the sheets, I felt a little curious. I poked my head out of the sheets to see if it was still there. That face was no longer there and had left a space where it was supposed to be, and after that I noticed something else strange. But even more apparent, there was someone in a white dress standing a few meters from my bed, right between the television and my bed. At that moment, I covered myself completely. 
I began to think about what room we were staying in. There was nothing, white, much less a dress. The walls were reddish, the floor was brown, so I couldn't have been confused. I pinched myself and opened my eyes wide to see if I was dreaming, but I wasn't. I tried to peek one last time to see the person in the white dress. I was trying to see where they were, and then I saw her. A face that I will never forget. Just when I lifted the sheets to look a little, I saw the beginning of a woman who was bending over looking at me. She had black hair, Asian features, pale skin like the moon, and a look that seemed to look at your soul. She had her eyes wide open and was only a few inches from my face. I covered myself completely with the sheets and yelled for my friends to turn on the lights. They were half asleep and asking me why, and I shouted it again, and when they finally got out of their bed, I inspected my surroundings. There was no trace of that woman. I checked the bathroom, the closet, but I couldn't find anything. My friends got angry and asked why I had waken them up. I told them what happened, and they naturally didn't believe me. When they turned the lights back off, I could not sleep and stayed up all night for fear that both the woman and the face of the closet would return again. Luckily, they did not appear again, and after that day, I did not see them anymore. The holidays continued as usual, and on the seventh day, we returned to my town. I have told this experience to several of my friends and only a few believe me, but this is a story for which I would give my life. This is true, but sadly, I have no proof. I live in California, and when I was 18 years old, I left the country for the first time. I graduated school a few months earlier with a 4.0 GPA, so my aunt and uncle took me on a trip to South America to celebrate. I was dating someone who isn't essential to the story at the time, but it comes up later. Anyway, we went to five different countries and were gone for months. My aunt and uncle were in their mid-twenties and the legal drinking age in South America is 18. So when we weren't sightseeing and spending the days traveling by bus, we were partying. We were staying in hotels and hostels. Luckily, they were all super friendly and the people were very lovely. We made many friends during our stays, some of whom we ran into other countries. For anyone who hasn't stayed in a hostel, they're mainly comprised of multiple rooms with bunk beds, shared bathrooms, and a standard room. So we get to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and check into our hostel. My aunt and uncle were bunking in a room with this German couple, who were very friendly. One night, my aunt, uncle, and I were out drinking. I danced, listened to music, ate great food, and the works. When we returned, the German couple was asleep in their bunk beds, so we decided to go into the common area so we wouldn't wake them. Our door opened in the common area so it was easy to access our room. So we were sitting at the bar drinking and I started talking to this guy. He was tall, a big dude who had these dreadlocks. He seemed to be in his 30s. I was having a friendly conversation, but this guy took it a little more, uh, weird. He started asking me if I wanted to go on a walk or if I wanted to go to the roof with him. Then he started touching my leg. I moved his hand away and said, sorry, I have a boyfriend. He laughed and said, a boyfriend? You need yourself a Peruvian. I laughed and responded, oh no, I'm okay with my boyfriend. Then he said, well, if your boyfriend cared about you, he wouldn't have let you come to South America without him. At that point, I made it obvious, or at least I thought I did, how uncomfortable I was and decided to go to bed. I told my aunt and uncle I was going to the room and said goodnight. I was lying in bed for a couple of minutes when the door opened and someone walked in. I assumed it was my uncle and didn't turn around. Suddenly, my covers lift and someone got in the bed with me. I turned over and it was the Peruvian guy. Usually in situations like this, my fight or flight was always fight, but being drunk in 5'3 and this guy being much more significant than me, I froze. He started pulling me closer and smiled. I just started saying, no, 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 to him, hoping to wake up the German couple. I don't remember what he said to me. All I remember is heavy breathing, touching me, and trying to kiss me while pushing him away. Finally, I told him, No, stop! Get out! Stop it! And I started kicking him. He got out of the bed, buckled, zipped his pants, and snuck out. I hadn't even noticed that he had undone his pants yet. I sat there shaking for a moment before I finally left the bed. I cracked our room door open and very quietly started calling for my aunt. She was laughing and talking to someone and told me to hold on, clearly not reading the situation. No fault to her. My uncle saw me and came into the room and asked me what had happened. I immediately burst into tears and told him before he stormed out of the room. 
The next thing I hear is a bunch of yelling in the standard room before my aunt and hostel manager fly into the space and turn the light on. I was standing there crying and they hugged me. The manager asked me if I was okay and who was it, what guy. So I told them and we walked back out. In this, the German couple had woken up to all the noise and were very confused. They felt terrible that they didn't hear me begging for the guy to stop. After a couple of minutes, all the yelling stopped and it was silent. My uncle and manager came back into the room and told me the guy wasn't even a guest at the hostel. He had somehow made his way past the front door. There was a lock and a key to get in that only guests had. They kicked him out and the manager profusely apologized to me. When my uncle left the room, he started screaming and looking for the guy. When he found him, he was standing there with a group of people laughing and drinking like he didn't just sexually assault a teenager. I think my uncle got physical and that's when everyone started yelling and the manager got involved. I don't think I slept after that night, at all. I'm getting chills writing about this. I know what happened wasn't okay, but I'm lucky it didn't go further than it did. I hope that guy never did anything like that to another woman again, but you know how it goes. If they've done it once, they've probably done it many times. My ghost story begins when I was just 14 years old, living in Argentina. My aunt on my father's side moved to another country and left the house to my parents as they were renting it, and it would obviously be better for us to live on a house we own. The first weeks in the house were completely quiet and peaceful. One of my cousins, who were living with us at the time, once he had arranged all his things, he had also moved with my aunt and then strange things randomly began to happen. Every time I went to the bathroom, I felt a cold spot just in front of the bathroom's door. It was summer, the first time I noticed this and the difference in temperature was alarming for me. Then one morning, my sister saw a girl with long brunette hair wearing a long shirt going towards the bathroom from our bedroom's door. We used to sleep on bunk beds and she slept at the lower bunk, so she thought that she saw me going to the bathroom. As a few moments passed and I didn't come back, she got up to see if everything was alright and then she saw that I was deeply asleep in my bed. She got really scared. When she told my mother about this, she tried to calm her down, saying it might have been her imagination. I never experienced something like that with this particular entity. I mean, I never saw her while awake, but when I began dance classes, I started dreaming of a girl who was exactly how my sister had described. In the dream, she was always on a very dark room. She was wearing ballet shoes and a gray dress going to her knees, and she was dancing staring at me with these cold, dead eyes. I had this dream on a regular basis during all the years I lived in my parents' house. Some weeks ago, I was talking with my brother about this experience, and he told me that he was always scared to look at himself in my mother's mirror, which was a full-body mirror, because there was always a girl his age, around six years old at the time, that would have been looking back at him. It would always freak him out, and he said he always saw the girl until he was about 14, maybe even 15 years old. I was curious whether our youngest brother saw her too, so we went to ask him. He said that he would only see her when one of us moved out of the house. She always seemed to be around four years old of age though, and that's the same age he was. So we started to get these strange facts from everybody in the house and putting them together. I asked my aunt if someone had died in the house and she told me that there were some deaths while the house was being constructed, but I don't think anybody in our particular family ever died here. But there are rumors that when they were building it, the family that first owned it did die. She told me about a man that apparently committed suicide and a girl who got electrocuted while trying to plug something in a PowerPoint near the bathroom. A curious detail is that I don't remember a time which our power was not broken or on the fritz. No matter how many times my parents tried and fixed it, it always broke again and we never got to use it. My siblings and I think that the different girls we saw or dreamt were in fact the same girl who changed form to be more, I guess, comfortable and fitting to our own personal ages. Thus, the attraction began and she kept following us. Anyway, I don't think she was trying to harm us. I think she just felt alone. Let me know what you think about this story. I will share other experiences of me and my family if you like it. And thank you for reading Swamp Dweller. I know my English might be a little rough. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. Today we will look at a different kind of case than I would usually investigate. 
I often cover mysteries and cold topics, and while this case isn't 100% unsolved, there are aspects of this case that remain open. Not long ago, I was live streaming and had a viewer call in and share their personal scary story. A viewer named Hannah called and shared a tragic story of her childhood friend Brendan Gonzalez and his untimely end. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into the disturbing case of Brendan Gonzalez. Brendan Gonzalez was just four years old at the time of his strange disappearance. He was last seen somewhere between 9 a.m. and 9.15 a.m. on January 6th of 2003 by his father, Ivan Hank, in Plattsmouth, Nebraska. To note, Ivan Hank and Rebecca Gonzalez, the mother of Brendan, were not together at the time and were not married. I noticed a few discrepancies with this detail over a few articles. At the time, Rebecca had custody of Brendan. Now, the timeline gets muddy here and hard to piece together. From what I can understand, some time later that day, police were actively looking for a robbery suspect and had spotted Ivan Hank driving somewhat erratically. For whatever reason, instead of pulling over, Ivan decided to lead the police on a high-speed chase, which only ended when he smashed his vehicle into a guardrail and rolled the car, totaling it. He was driving a 1997 Hyundai Accent, which he stole from Rebecca without her knowledge. Rebecca would be notified about the incident, and then would mention that she had not seen her son Brendan since that morning. Ivan was questioned about his son's whereabouts and initially claimed he left him with Rebecca. He was charged with willful reckless driving, which can have varying consequences depending on your state. For the state of Nebraska, where this occurred, willful reckless driving is a class 3 misdemeanor. Officials and family members conducted extensive searches but ultimately failed to find Brendan anywhere. This is where the case begins to turn from concerning to dire. Brendan Gonzalez's blood was found in the trunk of the car Ivan had wrecked. Officials found more of Brendan's blood on the car seat and even the garage of his home. While Ivan wasn't, an While Ivan wasn't initially the official's focus, he remained the primary suspect. Officials mentioned they suspected up to four people. I mean, just look at Ivan's background. He has an extensive criminal history, including drug abuse, mental instability, and even violent crimes. On April 29, 2003, Ivan Hank was sentenced to one year in jail for his police chase. Ivan would shock the world, though, using this spotlight to proclaim he had murdered Brendan. He claimed he did it with a kitchen knife in Rebecca's garage, which would explain the blood found there. Ivan would detail that he thought Brendan was the Antichrist and he had seen the number 666 on Brendan's forehead. Ivan took the police to a garbage bin in Bellevue, Nebraska. He claimed this is where he disposed of his son's body. Tests revealed Brendan's blood indeed was found in the garbage bin. Around 50 officials did their best to search the local landfill but were met with little to nothing. Air support was called in and tracking dogs and officials equipped with horses also explored surrounding areas. The search would eventually move within the city limits into Rebecca Gonzalez's property. Ivan Hank would later give officials a full confession of the murder in jail. Ivan claimed he had decapitated Brendan with a kitchen knife in Rebecca's garage. He stole Rebecca's car and dumped the body in a garbage bin in Bellevue. A bit later that year, in August, Ivan Hank was charged with the murder of four-year-old Brendan. Police continued searching for any sign of Brendan's remains but still have not found anything. Ivan Hank attempted suicide while serving his sentence in jail. He was unsuccessful in his attempt, though. Not long after his trial in 2005, Ivan pleaded guilty to save himself from a death sentence. Instead, he was given life in prison. Unfortunately, Brendan's body has never been found. Further searches for his remains are not likely due to the area his body most likely ended up in. With no one being able to 100% say Brendan Gonzalez is dead, but I think it's evident at this point, Details provided and the amount of blood found by officials, foul play is heavily suspected in this case. As we can see, this case is shrouded in many question marks. There seemed to be so much information left out on the timeline of events here. I wish we had more context at the start of the situation. In 2009, Ivan Hank appealed his case and claimed the police intentionally fabricated evidence in the case and claimed he had ineffective assistance from his counsel. This appeal was rejected in court, though. Ivan would insist that the crime scene investigator David Cafode planted blood evidence in a dumpster where Ivan claimed he had placed the boy's body. David Cafode has been convicted of growing evidence in an unrelated double. 
David Cafode has been convicted of planting evidence in an unrelated double murder case. This doesn't change my mind about Ivan Hank's guilt, but is an exciting detail. Over the years, Rebecca Gonzalez, now Rebecca Fleming, has tried numerous times to start searches for her son's remains. She has been shot down practically every time, being told the investigation has been exhausted and officials would need further evidence to begin anything again. Many have doubted her son is in the landfill, though, but Rebecca, she stands strong that she believes he is in there somewhere. The Sarpy County landfill is being shut down, and considering this, Rebecca has done her best to petition the land to be turned into a park in Memorial Brendan. Deputy Sarpy County Administrator Scott Bullock said the ground just isn't suitable for a garden. Not to worry, though. Sarpy County Board Member Jim Warren said he's working to find out what can be done to memorialize Brendan. Still, options might be restricted because of the State Department environmental quality requirements at the site. On the evening of October 5th of 2018, 26-year-old Terrence Woods Jr. was working as a TV production assistant on the first season of the Discovery Channel documentary series, Gold Rush, Dave Turin's Lost Mine. He was part of a 12-man team from London-based production company Raw TV who followed host Dave Turin as he explored abandoned mine shafts in the western United States. Given that most of these derelict mines were located in hilly or mountainous regions, some of Gold Rush's filming locations provided incredible views of the surrounding areas. And Terence took a great deal of pleasure in sharing such incredible vistas with his friends via his Instagram account. One picture depicted a fir forest under ceiling of steel-gray clouds with a babbling brook flowing through it. Captioned simply, Idaho. The photograph looked like the kind of scene that Bob Ross would paint. Yet as the evening unfolded, the events that transpired were proved to be anything but relaxing. On the contrary, something truly haunting was about to unfold. As the shoot wrapped up in an area known as Oro Grande, Terence told some of his fellow crew members that he needed to take a leak and would be back in a few minutes. But just moments later, associate producer Simon G. found Terence's walkie-talkie simply lying in the dirt. Simon wasn't necessarily alarmed by this right away and assumed that Terence had merely dropped it while looking for a place to pee. But then when he followed in the direction that Terence had apparently walked off in, he spotted something deeply disturbing. It was Terence, running down a steep slope at a speed which Simon later described as being faster than he had ever seen anyone run before. Seconds later, Simon watched Terence disappear into a thicket of greenery, then he quickly raised the alarm among his co-workers. Terence's colleagues tore after him at similarly high speeds but were unable to catch sight of him, and just as concerning was the fact that many of the team had suffered cuts and scrapes from the wild and inhospitable forest. If they'd been torn up in such a way while traveling at a fairly measured speeds, I could only imagine the kind of injuries that Terence had suffered. Yet the one prevailing question wasn't so much where Terence had run off to, it was what had caused him to become so frightened. Terence's fellow crew members reported him missing to the Idaho County Sheriff's Office at exactly 6.41 p.m., but due to the darkness that was quickly blanketing the area, the cops didn't begin their search for him until the following morning. His co-workers were incensed by the lack of action, but the county sheriff assured them that it was unlikely that Terrence had gotten far during the night. The rough terrain meant any progress he was likely to make would be slowed considerably, and on top of that, they were going to compensate for lost time by throwing everything they had into the search for him. At first light on October 6th, search teams consisting of foot patrols, ATV riders, and sniffer dog teams were joined by helicopters equipped with heat-sensitive cameras, each spiraling out in concentric rings that cast a wide net over the Oro Grande region. It seemed impossible for Terence to avoid such an intensive search, yet somehow, not a single trace of him was found, and just six days into the operation, the search was called off after the county sheriff declared that there was no way that Terence could be in the same area he disappeared from. For all intent and purpose, Terence Woods Jr. had dropped off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. 
Those that knew him found the story of his disappearance to be completely mystifying. The original Idaho County Sheriff's Office report stated that Terrence was right in the middle of a mental health crisis at the time he vanished. Yet his family and friends stated that they had talked to him extensively in the weeks prior, and aside from missing home a little, he seemed perfectly normal. His family then tried to contact various members of the production crew, as well as Oro Grande locals, but found only one that was willing to talk to them. While well-meaning, this local was of very little help, and said that it was impossible to determine what kind of mental state Terrence was in during the brief time they'd interacted with him. It got to the point where Terrence's parents, Valerie and Terrence Sr., believed that Raw TV was actually trying to cover up the truth of their son's disappearance. Each asserted that Terrence was a responsible, intelligent young man who wouldn't just run away unless he had been completely terrified by something. On the other hand, Raw TV denied hiding or obscuring any detail of Terrence's mindset or behavior, with the company spokesman saying that there is nothing to support such allegations and that Terrence had not been intimidated or mistreated by any of the Oro Grande locals or his co-workers. However, they did state that Terrence's conduct on that set had not been up to his usual standards and that he often seemed distracted during his work. When pressed on the matter, Raw TV CEO Jolie Feather described Woods' disappearance as heartbreaking, adding that the whole company was praying that their friend and co-worker would be safely recovered. She was also quick to note that the Idaho County Sheriff's Office had commended Raw TV for their complete cooperation, as well as their ongoing support for the investigation. During his youth, Terence had spent five years in the English capital of London, firstly as a student at the American International University, then working on shows like The Voice UK. He had made many friends during his time in England, and when word of his disappearance reached them, they were nothing short of devastated. One former colleague described him as the most pure-hearted person she'd ever met, that Terence was calm and gentle, and that she began screaming and crying when she received the bad news. It just didn't make sense, she later said. You know if somebody's going through something or they're a stressful person or whatever, you're like, okay, cool, the person took off because of mental health or whatever it might be. For Terence to run off, it's very bad. Disturbingly, this ex-colleague also added that there was something of a toxic work culture at Raw TV, something she herself experienced during her time there, and that on several occasions, she was made to feel quite uncomfortable with what she referred to as somewhat boyish working environment. Raw TV was quick to deny these claims, saying they did the utmost to make their employees feel welcome and comfortable, and their former employees' claims were not reflective of the company's policies. Another former colleague of Terence's, Rochelle Newman, said that a full investigation should be conducted to discover exactly what caused him to become so frightened. We need a timeline of events from when Terence arrived in Idaho until they said he disappeared. We need a full investigation into the crew, she said. If it was me who was filming and traveling for work, I would want the same to be done. Rochelle suggested that such an investigation should be entirely civilian-led, and urged the Idaho County Sheriff's Office to offer their full support and cooperation. This led to the establishment of an Instagram account entitled at Find Terrence Woods, which quickly gained upwards of a thousand followers, all of whom yearned for clarity regarding what happened on the night he went missing. We kept getting conflicting information, said Terrence's mother. One minute the police department are saying the case is closed and the next they're saying it's still active. This confusion seems to have stemmed from a law enforcement press release which stated that Terence's case is open but not active, and very little comfort seems to have been taken in the idea that the sheriff's department would follow up on any new information, and that there is no specific amount of time a missing person case remains active. It remains open as long as the person is missing. Given the complete lack of new information pertaining to Terence's disappearance, a number of theories have emerged regarding what might have happened or what he might have seen that caused him to become so terrified. The most prevalent seems to involve accusations of racism among the crew, as well as among the local or a grande citizenry. Many of Terence's nearest and dearest have noted that he was the only African American member of the production crew, and that someone might have taken a distinct disliking to his presence either on the team or in the area in general. 
It's been suggested that someone took advantage of the fact that Terence went off to use the bathroom and attempted to ambush or lynch him during the brief window that he was away from the crew. Some believe the fact that his radio was found abandoned is evidence that whoever grabbed him made sure to disarm him of any ability to effectively call for assistance. But if this is the case, why didn't Terence call for help at any point, even if he was free to do so? It makes sense that whoever grabbed him might cover his mouth, robbing Terence of his chance to scream for help. But if that was the case, at some point he managed to break free and make a run for it, so why not scream for help then? Again, it's possible there's an explanation for this, albeit a very disturbing one, that the whole production crew wanted Terence dead, and had told him this either overtly or covertly. If that was the case, it makes sense that Terence would simply just make a run for it without stopping, looking back, or calling for help. But why wait for an actual attack to occur before getting out of there? In so many words, some have accused the production company, especially associate producer Simon G, of fabricating the story of Terence running at full pelt in order to cover up that they killed him before dumping his body somewhere it could never be found. Yet the likelihood of the entire crew remaining tight-lipped about such an injustice is extremely slim, and if that was the case, surely the extensive search using cadaver dogs would have at least turned something up. Another arguably more plausible theory is that Terence had a run-in with some kind of predatory animal, one which stalked him, chased him, and killed him before dragging his dead body somewhere discreet in order to consume it. This might explain why the search teams were unable to locate or recover any of his remains during their intensive and extensive search of the area in which he went missing. Perhaps the cadaver dog teams were simply unlucky in their search, or a stronger odor masked the scent and prevented the dogs from distinguishing the distinct stench of human remains. But anyone who knows anything about a dog's mind-boggling powerful olfactory sense will tell you how extremely unlikely that is. And so, we're faced with the possibility that Terence either completely extricated himself from the area and managed to do so in almost pitch darkness, or that something otherworldly occurred to ensure that neither he nor his remains would ever be found. There are dozens of less plausible explanations which blame more supernatural hazards for Terence's disappearance, and although the shroud of mystery makes them more and more worthy of consideration, I don't believe it'll serve his memory well to explore them when much more conventional police work might still yield fruitful results. But still, ruminating on what could scare a man so badly that he'd go tearing off through the woods, injuring himself horribly in the process, is unsettling to say the least. Back home in Maryland, Terence's father finds each new day just as difficult as the one which took his son away. I don't want to watch movies with someone running through the woods because I think of my son, he told one media outlet. If I close my eyes, I see my son crying and yelling. Some nights I hear my son saying, Dad, Dad. I walk around the house and look at his room. Terence's parents still display photographs of him on their dresser, and one of his paintings hangs above their bedroom closet. The Dodge Charger Hemi, his parents bought for him still sits unused in the family driveway. Every so often, Terence Sr. runs the engine so that the battery won't run down, hoping that one day, Terence will return to finally drive it. But as each day passes, as each year rolls into the next, it seems less and less likely that Terence Woods Jr. will ever make it home. From time to time, I investigate cases centered around families. There seem to be many spouse-turned-killer cases out there. These cases uniquely intrigue me, for whatever reason. There seems to be something about a husband or a wife killing their spouse or even their children that makes me feel sick to my stomach. The very people you love and cherish more than anything in this world turning on you. How can someone go so far as to take the life of their lover and child? I will cover a case that fits this exact scenario. This case reminded me a lot of the Ann Dunlap case I covered not too long ago. This is the disturbing story of who killed Lacey Peterson. Before I jump right into this unfortunate crime, 
and the sad and tragic details that accompany it. I feel it is essential that I share some information about who Lacey Peterson was. Lacey Denise Rocha, also known as Lacey Peterson, was born May 4th, 1975 in Modesto, California. She was raised on her family's dairy farm in Escalon, California. Escalon is a small town with little more than 7,000 residents. Lacey spent much of her younger life working on the farm and enjoying gardening with her mother, something she continued to do throughout her life. Unfortunately, early on in Lacey's life, her parents got a divorce. Lacey moved with her mother to Modesto and visited her father on the weekend. Lacey was a very athletic teenager, participating as a cheerleader in middle school and high school. Lacey would go on to study and major in ornamental horticulture, which for those who are not, which for those who are not familiar, is the agriculture of plants and how to apply them to our everyday lives. She studied at California Polytechnic State University, one of the only polytechnic universities in the state. Lacey often hung out at Pacific Cafe, where one of her friends worked. Here is where the story truly begins because it was at this cafe that Lacey would meet Scott Peterson. It was mid-1994, and Lacey had made the first move. She had given Scott her number and told her mother that same day that she'd likely met the man she would marry. Scott and Lacey began talking and going out on dates together. Their first date was a deep sea fishing trip where apparently Lacey got very seasick. As the couple's relationship got more serious, the two began to set aside their dreams to create a life together. Scott put aside his professional golf ambitions, focused more on his reachable business paths, and after two years of dating, they moved in together. At the time, Scott was finishing his senior year of university, and Lacey was working in a nearby town called Prunedale. This seems to mark the start of Scott's extramarital affairs. Scott had at least two girlfriends on the side. It is unclear what the relationships were like, or who they were with. After Scott graduated, Scott and Lacey married in Avila Valley on August 9, 1997. The following year in June 1998, Lacey graduated with a bachelor's degree in agricultural business. Not long after this, the couple opened a sports bar called The Shack in San Luis Obispo. The company started slow but did eventually start booming on the weekends. The Petersons would sell The Shack and move back to Lacey's hometown of Modesto. They had purchased a beautiful three-bedroom bungalow house for around $177,000. Lacey would take a job as a part-time substitute teacher and Scott would take a job at Trade Corp USA, a newly founded American branch of a European fertilizer company. Scott made quite a comfortable living from this as well. Lacey's family and friends said she was the ideal housewife who always cooked, cleaned, or did something to help out around the house. When Lacey found out she was pregnant in 2002, it seemed to be a welcomed surprise by everyone. Lacey was set to give birth on February 16, 2003, and they were set to have a boy. The couple planned to name their son Connor. In November 2002, when Lacey was seven months pregnant, Scott met Amber Fry, a massage therapist in Fresno. Scott and Amber began having an affair. Amber was unaware of Scott's marriage and soon-to-be newborn child. Less than a month after this affair began, Lacey would seemingly vanish into thin air on a three-day weekend the couple spent together in Carmel, California, the week before Christmas. Carmel, from personal experience, is a lovely area. I recommend checking out the Point Lobos area if you ever get a chance. Aside from Scott Peterson, the last people known to have spoken with Lacey before she seemingly vanished was her sister, Amy Rocha, and her mother, Sharon Rocha. Now, I will try to create a timeline of her last known whereabout. On December 23, 2002, around 5.45 p.m., Lacey and Scott went to Amy Rocha's salon, where Scott had his hair cut. During this time, Amy claimed Scott offered to pick up a fruit basket for her that she had ordered since he would be playing golf in the area anyway. Scott seemed to want people to know he was playing golf on that day because, according to officials, he told multiple people that he would be doing so that day. Sharon called her daughter that night at 8.30 p.m. to have a talk with her. This would unknowingly be her last time she would ever speak to Lacey. Scott would go on to claim he had seen Lacey leaving the following day at about 9.30 a.m. He claimed he was golfing but quickly changed his story to fishing at the Berkeley Marina. According to Scott, Stacy was watching a cooking show while he was leaving. She was doing chores and preparing to walk the dog at a nearby park. 
At this point, Lacey would have been an eight and a half month. At this point, Lacey would have been eight and a half months pregnant. This would be the last official known whereabouts of Lacey. The next day, the neighbor came knocking as she found Peterson's dog, Mackenzie. This neighbor said she found the dog around 10:30 a.m. Another neighbor would come forward to say she saw Mackenzie at around 10.45 a.m. and was playing with his dog. An unknown person reported to the Modesto Bee that the dog was found with a muddy leash and was returned to Peterson's home. The neighbor who returned the dog claimed to see nothing out of the ordinary. Scott would return home from fishing and notice Lacey was gone and the dog in the backyard with a muddy leash. Instead of calling the police or loved ones to find out where his eight and a half month pregnant wife was, he decided to take a shower and wash his clothes as they were wet from fishing. Scott reported his wife missing only after waiting until 5 p.m. and calling his mother-in-law. Only then did Ron Gransky, Lacey's stepfather, call the police and inform them of his daughter's situation. When police arrived at the home, they were met with a strangely calm Scott Peterson. He didn't seem worried that his highly pregnant wife was potentially missing and in danger. It's not like Lacey was known to run out of the house unannounced so that you would think something out of the norm like this would cause some sort of emotional response. Police found Lacey's purse and car keys hanging up in the closet, and the dining room table looked to be meticulously set for family dinner, assumably for the following night. There was one thing that a detective noticed that disturbed him, though. On the table, a phone book was open to a page with a full-page ad for a defense lawyer. Now, this could be a coincidence, but it is also fair to look at it with suspicion. As I mentioned, the police were off-put by how Scott seemed really calm. I know many people point out that everyone reacts differently in these situations, but we need to be a bit realistic with ourselves. If you had a baby due in two to three weeks and your pregnant wife was missing, you would quite undoubtedly be upset. Despite these weird feelings and Lacey's family thinking Scott was guilty from the start, hundreds of searchers volunteered to help find Lacey. Modesto police and firefighters searched along Dry Creek which was the area Peterson's dog was found. A $25,000 initial reward was offered, and then increased to $250,000, and then once more to $500,000 for any information leading to Lacey's whereabouts. A candlelight vigil was held on December 30th to garner more attention about the case. Hundreds of posters, blue and yellow ribbons, and even a website were circulated around the area. According to the Wikipedia page on Lacey's case, Upwards of 1,500 people volunteered to help pass out materials to help find Lacey and her unborn son. This is where things start to get sick. On the way to his missing wife's vigil, Scott called Amber Fry and made up some weird elaborate lie that he was on his way to France and was planning on being in Paris for New Year's Eve. He even gave her a fake European phone number that would just reroute to his current cell phone number. Scott said, You know, in my mind, we could be wonderful together for the rest of our lives. On this phone call, the next day Scott called Amber to worship how beautiful she was and tell her he was in Paris. Unknown to him, though, Amber had already sold him out to the police and turned into an informant. Every conversation they had was being recorded. About a week after Lacey had been reported missing, Amber found out about Scott's wife and other life. She mentioned her friend showed her a video of Scott asking for information about his wife's location on TV. When Amber confronted Scott about this, he tried to explain it away, but wasn't making too much sense. Saying things like, There are different kinds of loss, Amber. When being questioned about why he lied about the loss of his wife, Scott would go on to say Lacey was, in fact, alive and she was still in Modesto. This was a major bombshell. As I mentioned, Lacey's family was convinced from the start that he had something to do with her disappearance. Their suspicions and fears were only amplified when they saw Amber come forward on TV. An interesting quote I found after reading articles online about this investigation mentions, I saw more reaction out of Scott when he burned the goddamn chicken. I believe this is a quote from Lacey's cousin. I mention this because Scott did not begin to get emotional until he realized Amber was not okay with his lies. Scott tried his best to convince Amber that Lacey was aware of the affair and was okay with it. The claim had been heavily refuted by virtually everyone who knew Lacey though. There is a famous sit-down interview with Scott and Diane Sawyer, where he tries to double down on this point, but I am not sure anyone is buying it. In this interview, Scott would go on to claim his marriage was quoted as glorious, as well as other exciting choice words. On April 13, 2003, a couple walking their dog stumbled upon something grisly. They found a decomposing body. 
but the body they found was a surprisingly well-preserved body of a late-term male fetus. The body was discovered in a marshy area in the San Francisco Bay, just north of Berkeley, not too far from where Scott claimed to have been fishing. Upon a closer look, the fetus had its umbilical cord still attached and looked to have been torn and not cut or clamped, as the standard practice would be. For whatever reason, a judge sealed off the autopsy results, but I was able to find an associated press source that revealed multiple loops of nylon tape had been found around the fetus's neck along with a nasty cut to the fetus's body. A day later, an unknown passerby was out for a walk when they found another body of a recently pregnant woman. She was wearing beige pants and a maternity bra. She was washed up on the rocky shoreline of the bay, roughly a mile or so where the fetus was discovered. The body was decomposed to the point of being nearly unrecognizable. The poor woman had been decapitated and her limbs were missing. A few days later, on April 18, 2003, DNA results determined the bodies found were of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son Connor. The autopsies reported that Connor's skin was not decomposed, but the right side of his body had been mutilated heavily, and the placenta and umbilical cord were not found. Lacey's cervix were intact and the exact date of death could not be determined. Lacey looked to have suffered from a severe beating. She had two cracked ribs, but the coroner said she could not say exactly how they died. All eyes were on Scott Peterson at this point. Scott was arrested on April 18, 2003 near a golf course where he claimed to have been meeting his brother and father. His naturally dark brown hair had been suddenly dyed blonde. Oddly, his car was full of miscellaneous items which included around $15,000 in cash, a ton of survival gear, camping equipment, and several changes of clothes. Four cell phones, two driver's license, one of which was his brother's, and funnily enough, a whopping 12 Viagra tablets. If this doesn't sound like someone trying to disappear and live off the grid, then I don't know what does. Scott's father, Lee Peterson, did mention Scott used his brother's ID to get a discount at the golf course and that Scott had begun to live in his car due to the media attention. Personally, from the reports, it seems his car was so full of stuff that it would be virtually impossible to live out of it, but I digress. Police saw this as an attempt to flee from the law. Three days later, on April 21, 2003, Scott was arraigned in the Stanislaus County Superior Court and was charged with two felony counts of murder with premeditation and exceptional circumstances. He, of course, pled not guilty and his trial was moved to San Mateo County due to the number of people in Stanislaus County having biased opinion. The trial began on June 1, 2004, and after many months of grueling practice and testimony, Scott was convicted of first-degree murder for his wife's death and second-degree murder for the end of his unborn child. Judge Alfred DeLucci gave Scott Peterson the death sentence, who was quoted as saying the murder of Lacey Peterson was cruel, uncaring, heartless and callous. Luckily for Scott, California rarely follows through with the death penalty. In March 2019, the California government issued a moratorium for all 737 prisoners on the death row in California, including Peterson. Essentially, this postpones any executions until the governor's tenure is done. This seemingly doesn't carry much weight though as California hasn't gone through with one of these since 2006. There has been a ton of controversy surrounding this case. Like many other issues that gain national attention, there are conflicting beliefs about what actually happened. As I researched this story, I found an excellent article by the New York Post that broke down why Scott was found guilty. To start, the bodies were found only a mile from where Scott claimed to have been fishing. Scott was noted to have been smirking and smiling throughout the trial. Scott had told Amber Fry he had lost his wife two weeks before she went missing. He exclusively referred to his missing son as Lacey's baby and never his own. He took multiple trips to San Francisco Bay around the time the bodies were found. He had $15,000 and a passport was hidden in his car at the time of his arrest. His general lack of emotion or care for his wife's safety. Not all is lost though in this tragic story. Lacey and Connor Peterson's death led to the creation of a new law known as the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, also known as Lacey and Connor's Law. This act ensures that under federal law, any person who causes death or injury to an unborn child while in the commission of a crime upon a pregnant woman will be charged with a separate offense. In October 2005, a Superior Court judge denied Scott's right to collect a $250,000 life insurance policy. Under California state law, criminals may not profit from insurance policies. 
Instead, the money was given to Lacey's family, more specifically Lacey's mother, as she was the executor of her estate. In 2006, Sharon Rocha wrote a book for her daughter titled, For Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss, and Justice, which became a number one seller on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. Sadly, there has been no more closure as to what exactly happened to Lacey Peterson. Why was she killed? Why was she killed in such a violent way? What could have possibly caused Scott to do this? Why not just divorce and move on? There are so many unanswered questions that remain in this case. I hope Lacey and Connor are resting peacefully and Scott gets what's coming for him. Hey Swamp Folk, right before we jump into this episode, I just want to let you know that my new podcast, The Dark Side of YouTube, which you can find on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and my second channel on YouTube, is currently giving away an Oculus Quest 2 bundle. If you're interested in winning that, all you have to do is leave us a 5-star rating on Apple Podcast, and in your review, leave the hashtag Darksiders. We will be picking a winner in a few days. And not to worry, anybody who doesn't have Apple and can't leave a review over there, we will be doing another giveaway very soon that can include even more people. Thank you so much, and let's get into these stories. Last month, my mom and dad decided to fill up on food and gasoline so we could drive up to Montana for a road trip to visit my friends and family over there. My family, my aunt in specific, we'll call her Dolly, owns a good piece of property in the Montana countryside. Her two sons, Clint and Coulter, live on the property with her, so we'd get the chance to meet them for the very first time. After a few days of driving north, we arrived at their house at about 6 a.m. Clint and Coulter are in their 20s, so they aren't much older than me. We hit it off as I had known them most of my entire life but never actually met them, met them in person. The six of us spent the day shooting guns, riding horses, throwing axes, and learning how to rope cattle. In case you couldn't already tell, Clint and Coulter are cowboys, but nothing out of the ordinary happened in that day. The scary part is what happened late that night. It was about 9pm, after a long day we all sat by a bonfire. We made and cooked small steaks and corn on the cob. After we ate, I got my guitar, Clint got his harmonica, and Coulter got his fiddle or violin, as most other people know it as. Anyway, we started playing our instruments and having a great time. Soon enough, my mom, dad, and Aunt Dolly began to dance. A couple of her hounds around the fire started hopping around and joining us. The oldest of the four just started wagging his tail. We had fun for about five to ten minutes until we heard a loud, disturbing noise. The land around this area is flat, and there were little to no trees, so it's easy to see stuff in the distance but it's pitch black outside other than the brightness from our fire. Whatever this was, it sounded like a cross between a yell from a man and a gunshot, and maybe even the cry of a buffalo. We all went pale, but Clint was the first to get up, draw his revolver from his side, and aim it in the direction we heard the yell come from. Run to the house and grab the rifles, Clint told me in a deep voice. Thankfully, my dad had a 38 special with him, so he could cover me on my way to the house. I ran for about 15 feet and tripped. Coulter ran over to help me up. When I looked up, the moonlight shone on something far in the distance. It looked to be about seven foot tall, skinny with long hair. It looked like it had horns or something. The shock of what I saw had made me nearly pass out. I would have fallen over like a dead man if Coulter did not hold me up. He set me down close to the fire. Clint got on one knee before me and asked, Are you alright? I answered back saying, I, I saw something. No one asked what I saw, but I'm pretty sure it was a skimwalker. I asked Coulter the following day if he saw it too, and he said no. No one else even remembered the loud yell. It's almost as if their minds were wiped. I'm starting to think it was all just a dream. But if it was a dream, why do I have a scraped up knee? My boyfriend Kai and I decided to go on a weekend road trip, and we also wanted to bring my boyfriend's Doberman Colt along with us. We took my dad's Ford F-150, which he let me use. Seeing as I was the only one who drove it, I put on the truck bed cover to protect our stuff. We packed enough food and supplies to last the weekend and set out. The first night went great. We ate dinner, swam in the river, fooled around a bit, and left after breakfast the next morning. Later that day, we were listening to music and joking, 
and half looking for places we could pitch our tent for the night. About two hours after we left that small town we stayed in the day before, we found a place we could stay. I pulled in as the sun was setting, and we went outside and got our stuff while Colt looked around. He was always protective and cautious of strangers, so we let him do his thing. Suddenly, he started growling. Kai and I looked over to the direction Colt was barking and saw a man appear from the clearing. Colt began growling aggressively and Kai had to hold him by the collar. This man looked to be about in his mid-40s, and not really built, but kind of lanky, perhaps around 6'3". My boyfriend is also 6'3", and in incredible shape. He hits the gym religiously as soon as he can. I'm 5'9 and have an athletic build, but by no means do I look strong. The man seemed to notice we were younger because he dropped his creeper face and smiled wide. What are you two kids doing out here? He spoke. His voice was gravelly and sounded like he had routinely smoked since he was 12 years old, and he didn't even acknowledge Colt, even though he was barking and starting to foam at the mouth. My boyfriend spoke up before I could say anything. We just decided to come hang out and get out of the way, you know? The man chuckled a bit and looked over at me. That pretty little thing, your sister? I stood there like a statue and said, no, I'm his girlfriend. The man nodded slowly and answered, Ah, that makes sense. We don't get too out of hand. He said before winking and walking into the woods again. I looked over at Kai and looked back at the woods. What the heck was that? He asked me. I just shrugged and kind of tried to shake that feeling of fear off my shoulders before we went back to setting up camp. After a while, we lit a fire and started snacking on some chips. I started thinking about the man and instinctively looked back to where he had disappeared into the woods. I saw nothing. Absolutely nothing, which for some reason scared me. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Suddenly Colt, lying between Kai and me, sat up, and the fur in his neck stood up. He looked over the fire and into the woods directly across from us. Kai slowly grabbed a large pocket knife from his hip, which I didn't know he had before, but in hindsight I'm very glad he did. He gestured for me to get into the tent and slowly followed me, not taking his eyes from the woods. I whispered to him, Do you think it's just a coyote or something? He shrugged. I don't know, but Colt doesn't alert for nothing. There's something in the tree line. He was cut off by Colt snarling. I thought he was aggressive before, but this was a whole nother level. I didn't even think dogs could get to this level. Kai practically laid over me to shield me from whatever this dog was growling at. Suddenly, Colt's aggressive snarls turned to cries and whimpers, and he ran into the tent and ran behind us. This freaked me out, and I started crying hysterically. Kai signaled for me to keep quiet, which was when we noticed there were footsteps outside of the tent. Kai lightly pushed me to the back of the tent, hunched over, and made his way to the front. He went to peek out, and I kicked his ankle. He looked at me confused, and I shook my head. We suddenly heard a familiar voice, and my blood turned to ice. Hey, I just wanted to let you know, your fire's still lit, not very safe. Kai cleared his throat, still holding the knife, and walked out of the tent. Thanks, we were gonna put it out soon. I could hear the fake confidence in his voice. Be careful out here, son. Some creep will kill a young man like you. Pretty things like that girl. Say, where is she? Kai lied. Oh, she went to bed a few minutes ago. The man let out a disappointed sigh, and he said, Well then, good night. And I heard footsteps go off back into the woods. Kai came into the tent and said, forget the tent, get Colt, and get in the truck. I didn't question it. I just got up, grabbed Colt's collar, and I kept crying as we got into the truck, hopped in, and started it up. And when we took off, only then, about 30 minutes later, did I even remotely feel at all safe again. Kai finally decided to tell me the man had a gun in his front pocket and did a lousy job of hiding it. We continued moving down a country road at about maybe 20 miles per hour and suddenly a large coyote walked out in front of us. We slammed on the brakes and it ran off. Any regular night, I would have just continued driving. But after everything that happened, I just sat there and started crying again. Kai unbuckled the seatbelt and wrapped his arms around me. Even though this might not sound scary to some, this experience horrified me. The feeling of helplessness scared me. The thought of that man using the gun on Kai frightened me. The idea that my dad would have no idea of knowing what happened to us scared me. An actual human is way scarier than any cryptid or anything supernatural because humans are real and can cause real danger. Stay safe out there. Around three years ago, my high school class went on a hiking field trip. It would be a three-night trip. 
Luckily, in my class, I had my friend Jonas and my girlfriend Ashley, and my brother David. We were super excited about the class trip because we had never been on an overnight road trip in school before. It was two days before the trip. I was hanging out at break with Jonas. We were talking about what was going to happen on the trip. I'm super pumped for this dude, Jonas said. Let's hope we don't get eaten by a mountain lion, I joked. Funny joke, man. Way to ruin the trip for me, Jonas said. Don't worry, Jonas. You won't get eaten since you have no meat on your bones, I joked. Oh, shut it, Luke. It's not like you have any meat either, he responded. That's when David joined us. Sup, guys. Where's Ashley? He asked. She's talking to her friends right now, I answered. Then the bell rang. Well, I'll see you guys later. The day of the trip had finally come. When we all piled on the bus, all four of us were lucky to get in the back seats together. Ashley and I were on the left, and Jonas and David were on the right. We were riding the typical school bus that picks you up in the morning, the big old yellow thing. Look at the lovebirds sitting aside from each other, Jonas said. <laughs> Shut up, Jonas, Ashley said. I don't get how you can stand those two, she said. Oh, trust me, I can't, I replied. The bus ride was about five hours long. Half the kids were already asleep by the time we were halfway there. When we finally reached the mountains, we stepped out of the bus and couldn't believe our eyes. It was such a beautiful sight. High mountains, with dark green leaves all over the trees surrounding it. You can hear rivers and creeks flowing and birds chirping. It looked like a paradise. Our teacher told us to come on when we got done taking in the sights because we had to meet up with the guide. As we made our way to the ranger station to pick up the map, I couldn't help but notice this eerie feeling that I had. It felt like someone was watching us. Hey, speed it up, man, Jonas shouted. Okay, okay, Mr. Impatient, I responded. Our guide was already waiting for us when we got to the ranger station. Good morning, folks. My name is Jones, and I will be your guide for the next three days. Jones told us everything. He handed us all a map and spoke. Anyone who needs to use the restroom before we go, it's going to be about three miles before we make it to our campsite, needs to go now. After everyone stopped using the restroom, we started making our way to the campsite. Alright kids, don't forget this is a science field trip. That means we will be learning about wildlife here, Mrs. Fink said. I was excited to learn about the wildlife here since I liked animals. Not many other people shared my exact thought though. I'm excited to see the waterfall when we get there, Ashley said. Me too. Hopefully Jonas might fall in. I spoke, and we both laughed. I heard that. I'm not deaf, you know, Jonas responded. Oh, my bad. I thought you were blind, David said. Shut up, David, Jonas said. About one and a half miles into our hike, I got that same feeling again. It felt like we were being watched. You okay, Luke? David asked. Yeah, you've been acting strange since we got here, Ashley said. I'm not too sure, guys. It feels strange out here, like we are all being watched or something, I answered. Looks like the mountain lion will get you after all, Jonas joked. We continued the entire time. It felt like we were being watched, and one time, I could have swore I saw something peeking at me from behind a tree. When our class eventually made it to the campsite, it was about 3 p.m., so it was still bright outside. There were about 15 kids, and we only brought five tents, so three kids would have to sleep in one tent. The teacher and the guide brought their own. I had to share a tent with Jonas and David, and Ashley got her two friends Kylie and Whitney. When we finished setting up our tents, the tour guide said we would go to the waterfall since it was still bright. The waterfall was about a mile away from our campsite. Ashley and her friends were excited to go. David, Jonas, and our friend Michael weren't all stoked. We were the only guys on the trip. When we made it to the waterfall, it was just as you expected. Water falling off a cliff. Not that exciting. While looking at the waterfall, I thought I got a small glimpse of what I could tell to be a head peeking out from a side of rock. Hey guys, did you see that? I asked. See what? They said. Something is peeking out from that rock. I answered. Pro, what are you talking about? Michael asked. Don't worry about him, Michael. He's been acting strange the entire time we've been here, David said. I swear I saw something, guys, I said. Stop trying to scare us. Like, it's getting old. Jonas said. I'm not trying to scare you guys. I saw something peeking out from behind that rock. I spoke. Give him a break, guys, Ashley said. Did you see it, Ashley? I asked. No, I, I didn't, Luke. It could have just been your eyes playing tricks on you. After all, it is close to sunset, she said. Maybe you're right, Ashley, I said. Once we get back to camp and eat, you should be fine. Michael then interrupted. 
When we returned to camp, I still couldn't get over what I saw and how nobody believed me. When I started thinking, I thought about the story Richard told me, about how he and Jerry were attacked by a creature a while back. Sadly, they weren't on this trip. They snuck out of Jerry's house to Ding Dong Ditch when he kept seeing a black figure the entire time follow them. Eventually, when they made their way back, they smelt something horrible. They went to check it out, and it turned out to be some sort of creature. They were then attacked, but they somehow made it home safely. When he told the story, I thought he was lying, but I was beginning to believe it was true while out here. We weren't near northern Alabama anymore, so I was just thinking I saw things or was hallucinating. When we got back to camp, our guide asked us if the four of us wanted to volunteer to do some firewood scouting to collect firewood. Me, Michael, David, and Jonas volunteered to do it. The guide showed us where to look and told us not to go too far away from the campsite. We made our way from the camp and into the woods. We split up to look when we got to where the guide told us to go. While I was looking, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned to look, but there was nothing there. Hello? Is anyone there? I asked, but I got no response. I ignored it and kept looking for firewood. While looking, I heard more footsteps, and they were closer now. Hello? Is anyone there? I shouted. Truthfully, I was starting to get freaked out at this point. I turned around when suddenly, BOO! Jonas shouted, and I freaked out. You should have seen the look on your face, David said. You were freaked out, Michael joined in. That wasn't funny, guys, I said. It was, David responded. How about we finish getting the firewood, I said. Fine, but you must admit that was pretty funny, Michael asked. Okay, yeah, it was a little funny, I responded. See, I told you. All right, let's get back to the camp now, Jonas insisted. When we got back to the camp, we gave the firewood to our guide, and he made a campfire for us. We ate dinner, and after that, we made s'mores. It was pretty good, not going to lie. After that, we had a scary story contest. I won when we finished doing all of that. It was time for us to finally go to sleep. While in the tent with Jonas and David, I had to use the restroom. I got out of the tent and went a little way down the trail. When I was done, I started to make my way back up the course again. I heard footsteps once more. Ha ha, very funny guys, that's getting old, come on now, I spoke. I got no response though. Must have been a deer or something, I thought to myself. I started making my way back up the trail when I heard even more footsteps, this time louder than before. A stench began to fill the air. It smelled like a dead animal. I turned around and saw a silhouette in the dark. I freaked out and started running as fast as humanly possible. I heard it coming up behind me. It was quick, swift. It let out a roar resembling a deer and a lion mixed together. I was almost to camp when the creature stopped following me. I quickly got into my tent and zipped it up as fast as I could. Jonas and David asked me what had happened. I was shaking and stuttering my words. Something ch chased me to the camp, I said. It was probably a mountain lion or something, Jonas said. No, it was tall and stood on two legs, I responded, and it let out a roar resembling like a deer and a lion, I said. You were probably tired and hallucinating, David said. Maybe you're right, I responded. We can talk about this in the morning. When morning came, we were the first group to wake up. We decided to go down to the place where I saw the thing. While looking around, Jonas found a track that looked like a deer's track. See, I told you you were hallucinating, David said. I swear I saw something, though, I said. Yeah, you saw something, all right. A deer, Jonas joked. Funny, Jonas, I spoke. Anyways, let's head back to camp before everyone else wakes up, I said. When we got back to the camp, everyone else was still asleep. We decided to go ahead and make breakfast for everyone. When everyone woke up, they were met with eggs and bacon. The teacher and the guide thanked us, and when everyone was finished, the tour guide told us what we were going to do that day. There would be three groups of five people, and each group would have one team leader. The groups would go out into the woods and write down all the wildlife that they saw. For example, if one of us sees a mushroom, we tell the team leader to write down brown mushroom. If someone sees a mouse, then obviously we'd write down that we saw a mouse. The group with the most written down gets double dessert that night. So, for the groups, me, Ashley, Jonas, David, and Michael, and the group leader for us was David, the guide showed us the area we had to stay on in the map, and everyone was in a team. Then, once it's noon, everyone needs to head back to the camp. Our team was already off to a good start. We had like 15 things written down within just a few minutes. It was about 11 a.m. when we ran into another group. We said our hellos and continued. 
At this time, we had about 30 things written down, so I had forgotten entirely about what happened the night before. While we were still looking for stuff to write on our list, I got that strange feeling again, but this time much more intense. Like it was all around me. That's when I heard Ashley scream. The creature was standing under a small oak tree about 30 yards from our position. I couldn't see it that well, though. We started running away from that thing as fast as we could. We ran off the trail trying to lose it, which was a terrible idea. When we eventually stopped to catch our breath, it was nowhere to be seen. I think we lost it, guys, Michael said. What was that thing? Ashley asked. That's the thing I saw last night, I answered. You went outside last night without telling anybody? You could have gotten hurt, and nobody would have known, Ashley exclaimed. Now's not the time for that. We are lost, and something is hunting us, David said. How will we get back to camp if we don't have a map? Ashley asked. We must find the trail. It shall lead us back to the camp, Jonas said. I remember which way we ran, Michael exclaimed. Would you like to lead the way then? I asked. Yeah, Michael said. When we started following Michael, we kept our eyes and ears open and tried to make as little noise as possible. It's way too quiet out here. I don't hear a single bird, Jonas said. For once, I agree with you, Jonas, Ashley mentioned. Guys, shut up. We're making too much noise, David said. We are still following Michael at this point. It was probably only 1 p.m. before we found the trail. We need to hurry and get back to camp before we get in trouble, Michael said. Are you sure this is the right trail, I asked. Yes, Luke, I'm sure. There's a slight problem, though. I don't know what part of the trail we are on, Michael said. Oh, isn't that just great? We're lost, Jonas mentioned once more. Listen, everyone needs to calm down, okay? We need to find a sign or something, that's all. It gives us all the directions we will need, David said. Well, which way should we go, then? I say we head down the trail, so we don't get too deep into the woods, I said. All right, let's go, then, Jonas mentioned. There was a faint breathing noise. We all started shaking at this point. Then we heard footsteps, loud footsteps. It sounded as if someone was dropping sledgehammers on the ground. That's when we listened to the lion deer-like roar once more. We started running like bats out of hell. It was right behind us and we could smell that horrible smell. We could hear its footsteps as it got closer and closer and closer. We didn't know where we were going. That's when I tripped on a tree root. I screamed for help and David came back to pick me up but the creature hit him down. Jonas came and threw a stick at it. I was able to get up and help David up. Michael shined a flashlight at it, and it let out this god-awful roar again. I was able to get a good look at it this time. This thing was eight feet tall and had a deer skull for its head. It was skinny to the point that it looked like a skeleton. It hit Michael with its forearm. I screamed for Ashley to run. When I did that, it grabbed me and tried to bite at me. David was able to throw a rock at it, which caused it to let out another roar and distract it. It scratched David and ran away. David, are you okay? I asked. Yeah, I'm fine, he responded. We need to find Ashley, she ran that way, Jonas yelled. While walking down the trail, we found a fire watch tower. We walked up the stairs and knocked on the door and were greeted by a ranger who led us inside. What happened to you, kiddos? Why are you guys out here so late? He asked. We're on a school trip and yesterday we were doing an activity and got lost. We also got attacked by a bear, Michael said. So you guys are the kids we should be looking out for, he said. I will contact your guide and tell her we found you, he said. Can you also ask them if they found Ashley? I asked. When we met with our class, our teacher and guide hugged us and asked if we were alright. Ashley ended up running into them eventually, petrified. We soon left that day, never to return. About a month later, a group of college students went camping and went missing. I'm pretty sure I know what happened to them. If you're ever up on a hiking trip and feel like something is watching you, Keep an eye out, because you might not be alone. This happened about three years ago. I'm 17 years old now, but still, I was traumatized after this happened on my birthday. My name is Gianna. I'm a female, and I lived in a small town in New Jersey. I had about nine friends, and we were a group of ten. My friends were Alan, Ryan, Ernesto, Ben, Tim, Jessica, Kai, and my cousins Willie and Ruth. Ernesto and I were closest. We had known each other since middle school. I was about to turn 15, getting ready for my birthday party, and was excited. I decided to have a cabin party, so my mother decided to rent out a small cabin for my birthday. A cozy place in the middle of the woods, where we would have access to a kitchen, a living room with a TV, and three bedrooms. 
That day was going to be cozy and peaceful. My mom helped me with the decorations before my friends could arrive. We hung balloons, streamers, and string lights so that they could give a bit of cottagecore vibes. By the time we finished putting up the decorations, I heard knocks at the door. I had gone to get it and my cousins and friends arrived as soon as I saw Ernesto, I gave him a tight hug and welcomed them all inside and said, you're all just on time. As soon as we got settled, my mom ordered us pizza. After eating pizza, we all huddled together and started telling stories. Sometime later, my mom told me she had to go into town to get some things. My mom was a bit worried about leaving us all of there alone. I assured her that we were all old enough to watch ourselves and I promised my mom to check all the doors and lock all the windows. Once my mom left, we all went outside to start a fire and cook some s'mores. We were all having a great time telling scary stories. By the campfire, one of my friends Jessica started to tell this true crime story about a female serial murderer. We were laughing and giggling, hiding the fact that we were a bit scared, but Ben told us that his mom and dad got a divorce after he came out as gay. His mom supported him, but his dad was crazy and definitely didn't agree. His mom and dad split because of it. He would constantly harass him and his mom. His mother got to the point where she had to file a restraining order against his own father and Ben nearly crying while Kai was holding his hand. We asked him what his father looked like if he had a photo or anything like that. He did and he showed it to us. After showing us the picture, we suddenly heard a loud crunching noise coming from the woods. Remember that we were in the middle of nowhere and the next neighbor was probably about a mile or two away. That's when Ernesto said, What the hell is that? I said in a calm voice, Maybe it's an animal. Alan, the bravest of the group said, Oh hell no. I've never heard an animal make that sound before. I started to agree with Alan because what kind of animal makes a crunching sound? I guess I should clarify, it wasn't like a crunch of a twig or a leaf. It was the crunch like if you were biting down on a bone or something. We got back to making some s'mores. My cousin Ruth told another story. Her crush on this girl in school. We were so deeply interested in her report that we forgot about the sound until we heard it again. But this time... It was much closer. We all got creeped out at this point. We had to go inside. We all power walked towards the cabin. As soon as we all got inside, I locked the doors behind us and made sure the deadbolt was locked as tight as it could. As soon as we all got inside, we decided that we should watch a show before hitting the hay. So we all agreed to watch some anime on Netflix. After we watched a season of the show, all of us went to bed at the same time. We had to split up since three of the rooms were downstairs and three of the rooms were upstairs. Four of us were sleeping in the living room, and the rest slept upstairs in the bedroom. Kai and Ben slept in one of the rooms upstairs while Alan and Tim slept in the other. We all wished each other a good night, and we all went to sleep. My three other friends had already gone to sleep while I was on my phone scrolling through Instagram. Until I started feeling my highs... Until I started feeling my eyes get heavy... Once I felt more tired, I plugged my phone into the charger and drifted off to sleep. I may have been asleep for just a few minutes when I heard loud banging at the door. All four of us were instantly awake and one had to go see who was at the door. I decided to be brave and check it out. All our hearts nearly skipped a beat. The cabin was a bit old. It did not have a peephole, so I couldn't see who it was at the door very well. The rest of us decided not to wake up the rest of our friends because we didn't want to creep them out if it was nothing and we were sure it probably was just an animal or a stray dog. But the direction of the sound changed and moved towards the window. Precisely the living room window. Someone was tapping very hard on the window pane. I got down on my hands and knees and carefully went to look out the window. I pulled back the drapes just a little bit to see who was outside. What I saw made me freeze in fear. I was face to face with a very tall man, probably in his 50s. He had no shirt on. The guy was only in boxers and he had no socks or shoes. He was holding a hunting rifle. The moment he saw me, he smiled at me with a broad smile. He was also waving at me as if he was taunting me. He pointed to the front door as if he were telling me to let him in, but I instantly recognized that this was Ben's father from the photo that Ben showed us. I dropped the curtain back and went downstairs. I got my cousin and my friend awake, and I told them what I saw and who was outside. They were all scared, just as I was. We decided to all go upstairs and huddle together. Ernesto and Ryan went to wake up Alan and Tim, and then went to Kai and Ben's room. We all told them that there was a crazy person outside the window. 
They were also tired, and when I say crazy person, they all jolted awake, now entirely on guard. When Kai and Ben asked who was outside, I was hesitant to tell them, but I said, it's your dad, Ben. I saw Ben's face change into a horrified expression, and seen the tears start to fill up in his eyes. Jessica and Tim tried to comfort him, including Kai, who was starting to melt down. Some of them were skeptical and asked me if I was dreaming or something. I assured them that I was fully awake the moment I said that. Suddenly, we start to hear loud banging sounds coming from the door along with the voice from Ben's dad saying, Let me in, little kids. We were all horrified, standing still and not knowing what to do. One of us or some of us had to go downstairs to get one of our phones to call the police. We all decided to go down as a group. Ben's psycho of a father already knew that we were already in the cabin, but we didn't want to let him know our location within the house. Tim went to grab his phone. You're probably wondering whether we looked for weapons, like in every horror movie. If you're wondering, of course we did. The rest of us ransacked the closet looking for something to defend ourselves with. Jessica and Ruth took out some chopping knives from the kitchen. Ben got some pepper spray he found. I eventually got a metal bat, and Ernesto grabbed a pocket knife. Tim was tasked with calling the police, and that the service was tacky. We were having a hard time getting through. I told him to hold on, and then I would check my phone. Before I even got to the living room, we heard a loud banging from the front door. Ben's dad was trying to kick down the door. After many more kicks, he put a big hole in the door and his foot went through. He said, I'm going to kill you. The rest of my friends were all screaming like crazy. Before he could unlock the door, I ran over, approached him, and sprayed him in the eyes and nose with the pepper spray we had. His dad jumped back and screamed in pain, screaming racial slurs and bad words. Ben swung open the door and yelled at me, saying, Gianna, hit him! I picked up the metal bat and turned it hard on his dad's head. His psycho dad fell to the ground, not moving. We all ran back upstairs and ran inside upstairs. We all worked together to barricade the door. Then I remember to... Then I remembered Tim still had his phone. I asked him to let me see it and call 911. Luckily, the call managed to get through. I told our situation to the operator, our location, and how many of us there were. The operator told us to stay in the barricaded room until the police arrived and that they would send a few officers to the scene, and we hung up the call. But we realized the door was now open wide so the psycho could come in, and nothing stopped him. We sat in the room for what felt like an eternity until we heard sirens in the distance and could see flashing lights around the cabin. There were about five police cars outside. Luckily, the sicko was still unconscious when the police arrived, and they took him away in handcuffs. When he woke up, he found himself in a police car. The police then greeted us and asked to give a statement. We told them everything that happened, and they made sure we weren't injured. We were all in touch, very traumatized about what had just happened and shaken up, and we all just wanted to go home. The cops stayed with us until our parents came to pick us all up. As I said at the story's beginning, we live in a small town and it didn't take long for everybody to hear the news. We discovered that Ben's father had somehow found that Ben... We discovered that Ben's father had somehow found out that I invited Ben to my birthday party at the cabin and planned to kill him and all of us. According to the police report, he was incredibly high on illegal substances when he tried to break into the house. Ben has been seeing his therapist but I thank him and myself every single day. If it weren't for intelligent thinking, we wouldn't be alive today, and I'm happy we made it out of those woods alive. I live in the middle of nowhere, Ohio. You can call it rural now, but growing up, there were only three houses on our three-mile-long road. Since then, farmland has been sold, and many townies, as they call it, have moved to the area. Growing up, it was very quiet. I was a single child and my parents were at work often, or tending to livestock. At night, coyotes often yipped amongst other nightlife noises, but the shadows scared me the most. I wouldn't see them outside very often, just the occasional moment when you feel like you're being watched. I saw the shadows, mostly inside of the house. Your home is supposed to be safe, a place where you can get away from the creatures and the scary things. If you can picture an L-shaped hallway, my bedroom was at the base of the L, my parents' room at the top, and the family room at the end. Almost every time I would leave my room to go to the family room, I swear I would see something out of the corner of my eye. Sometimes it was low to the ground on all fours. Other times, it was taller, almost taking up the entire doorway. But whenever I would look towards it, 
Nothing would ever be there. The shadows would never follow me to the rest of the house, and they would never go inside my bedroom. They stayed in my parents' room. I had to go to my parents' room to use the shower, and I would turn on all the lights going down the hallways in the room and the bathroom. I never saw the shadows while I was in the room, but I also tried not to spend much time in there in the evenings or at night. A weird coincidence is that their room has a crawl space under it, not a full basement like the rest of the house. I would avoid the access point to the crawl space any time I could, and any time I went in the basement, I would never go to that area. I just felt like something was watching me and waiting to pounce. The shadows upstairs seemed threatening because they were so dark, but I never felt like my life was in danger per se. The feeling in the basement was different though. It was more hostile, and I did not like being down there alone. Call it childish fear, or an overactive imagination. I don't care. It scared me, well, at first. My first memory of seeing them was probably age 10. As I got older and came into the whole, I don't care, I'm a teenager mode, I started shrugging it off more and more. I would still see them, but I just wouldn't look anymore. I would keep walking, like, okay, you're there, let's coexist. I never told anybody about this. My parents are very by the book and would have dismissed me or sent me to some place to help my mental instability. We do have native heritage, but it is several generations back. I have found arrowheads in the creek nearby, but it's hard to say if any of that is related. I have since moved and my parents still live there. I honestly don't visit them after dark, so I cannot say if they are still there or not. Thank you for listening to my story. I know it's not the most horrifying story, but it's generally odd and strange, and it made me feel creeped out for many years. My boyfriend and I adore hiking, and there are so many places to go because of where we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11pm to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times and neither of us were ever concerned that something would happen. There was only one thing we were kind of nervous about, wildlife that had just happened to jump out at us. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire, the path was immaculate and stable. We started walking up the trail and we just started talking about paranormal things, witchcraft and even wendigos. I know, terrible move on our side talking about things like that. Now, it is to be noted that we both had flashlights and they worked just fine, brand new batteries and everything. We were both being very observant as to where we ended up on the path. As we got deeper into conversation, we both realized in just a few seconds that we were not on the trail anymore and nowhere near one. I mean, it was like out of a blink of an eye, we were on the trail, and suddenly, we're just in the middle of the woods. Suddenly, I remember walking on the course, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him we needed to start backtracking, but thankfully he said no because we could not see the trail around us or anything we recognized. If we tried backtracking, I would not be here writing this, probably. He told me we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge or finding the path again. We walked up for a while up the mountain, when thankfully, we popped out on a fire road. We walked down terrified and came out on a road about a mile away from where our car was. I just wanted to share this weird experience, because I have no idea how to explain it. It's almost impossible that we would just wander off the trail and not notice. I know we were in conversation, but we were still very diligent of our surroundings. I also need to note that we have barely any memory of the time out there. It just reminds me a lot of these strange missing 411 stories I've heard on the Swamp Dweller channel, and I wanted to send in this short experience to see what the Swamp Dwellers think. Thank you for sharing my story, and I hope somebody in the comments can give me some sort of information as what the heck happened to me. This happened in early November of 2016. I was moving to Philly from Chicago, and my boyfriend had flown in to help me drive across the country. My parents live in Ohio, so we were on our way after making a pit stop there. Being broke at the time and wanting to save on tolls, we decided to take the toll-free route, landing in Philly in about 10 hours. Initially, we were going to leave my parents' place early, but we got distracted and didn't leave until about 4 p.m. Not a big deal. I've driven from Chicago to California and hiked parts of the PCT and the AT by myself. I was mostly bummed because the sun would be down by the time we get to all the pretty foliage in the Smokies. 
Now, the route we picked essentially had you dipping in and out between West Virginia and Pennsylvania. The parts of West Virginia we would be driving through are home to the Mothman appearances. I was excited about it as those stories fascinate me. Living in this city, I don't often get to see a clear night sky. Having road tripped a lot, I know sometimes more scenic highways would have had better viewpoint pullovers. So, when we were in West Virginia, I told my boyfriend to Google one and see if anything popped up. Sure enough, he found one. Being busy driving, I didn't bother to look at the GPS and followed his directions. I thought it was weird that the GPS told us to get off the highway since usually these vistas are located right on the road, like a rest stop. Whatever I thought. We take the exit, turn down this dimly lit road, and it leads us up a smaller mountain base. I find it strange that there aren't any other cars around. I saw a rusty sign for a scenic lookout, which pointed us down what looked like a service road. The road itself was not paved, and the only other road leading off was gated off. Both of us got a peculiar feeling. I turned off the music because it was so creepy quiet, and my radio now sounded like it was blasting in like concert speakers, even though it really wasn't that loud. We could hear every leaf my car was crunching under its tires. After going maybe half a mile down this road, we got way too spooked and said F it, and went back, and I went to make a three-point turn to get out of there. At this point, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. We drove maybe 50 feet before we saw a tree lying across the road that we had just drove on. Me turning around perhaps two minutes later, like I said, this was almost impossible. Things were so quiet that we would have heard this tree fall behind us. Panic started to take over, and something told me that we couldn't just sit there and think long and hard about what to do. So my boyfriend said he would go see if he could lift it and get it out of the way. I had my brights on and was scanning the surrounding woods for movement. I felt eyes on us but couldn't see anything. The tree didn't appear old. It was as if someone knocked it over just in front of us. As soon as my boyfriend was out of the car, I first told him that I loved him and then locked the doors. I know, I'm an asshole. Thankfully, he could move the tree just enough for my car to squeeze through, and as soon as he was back in the car, we gunned it out of there. I'm very spiritual and believe there are things in the woods that don't always... I'm very spiritual and believe there are things in the woods that we don't always see. My boyfriend, on the other hand, is an atheist. That night, we both agreed that something sinister was out there in the woods with us. It might seem anticlimactic, but this genuinely freaked me the hell out. And if you guys have any ideas who, what, or why this random tree fell in the road without any noise, I would love to know. I never enjoyed camping. I savored the comfortability that modern life affords. But every year, my old group of high school friends would go up to the same lake, set up the tents on the same shorefront, drink the same beer, and tell the same stories. I always did enjoy that. It was like having a lousy job, but all your coworkers were awesome. It was making it just bearable. So, for the two to three days a year, I put myself through crapping in the woods for the laughs that came with it. We'd all drive up on the Friday after work and usually take the Monday off following the weekend and stay until then. We'd park and hike two kilometers along the water to the campsite we always went to and set up there for the long weekend. The last time we went camping, I was running late. I had a project to finalize and it was sent back by my boss to be tweaked. I couldn't leave the city with my girlfriend Kat until after 9pm. A storm was at our backs the whole drive up to the country and it seemed to be headed right where we were. Then we hit traffic. An 18-wheeler had jackknifed, and the road was getting cleaned up. The pre-storm rain caught up with us. Kat and I didn't get to turn off for the camp parking lot until after midnight. I recognized all four of my friend's cars parked near the waterfront. Then a flurry of text came in from my buddy Jeremy. The reception was spotty, so you could never really count on communication that way. The text had been sent a few hours apart. Jeremy told me they'd switched sites this year, and they'd finally made it to what they called the island. The island was always spoken of as being forbidden, mainly because it was near impossible to get to. It was diamond-shaped, but longer than wide. It was surrounded by sharp rocks and filled with dense trees. A heavy current came at it, head-on, and split the water rush to both sides. This made it impossible to reach because the only side that wasn't overcome with rapids and sharp rocks was the backside, 
which had a high, rocky cliff that jetted up 30 feet above the water. The ridge had a large, flat surface that looked out onto the lake and would have been the perfect campsite. If only it were accessible. Because of the heavy rapids and rocks, it remained untouched and was the place everyone wanted to camp, but no one could. Kayakers and boaters avoided the rapids around it because of how sharp the rocks were. It was a beautiful thing to look at, but treacherous and potentially fatal to attempt to conquer. That year, there had been a severe drought in the country, though. It had not rained in weeks, so the water was down, and the rocky lake bed of the rapids was exposed. You could now walk across the island. Jeremy said the group made a snap decision. They trekked across and camped on the site everyone had always wanted to be. He told me they had set up their tents on the rock slab that overlooked the lake and saved me a spot near the back. I felt uneasy reading the text. I didn't know much about the lake or water flow systems, but with the storm at our backs, who knew how long the rapids would stay down? We could get trapped on the island. Cat felt uneasy about it too, but we packed all of our gear and trekked along the waterfront to our usual campsite. From there, we could see the island and all my friends' tents on the rock slab that overlooked the lake. The storm had finally caught up to us and the rain was getting heavier. Cat and I decided to stay at our usual spot for the night, and I set up a tarp overhead so we could pitch the tent without getting everything soaked. When that was done, we were both exhausted, and she crawled into her sleeping bag. I ventured out in my rain slicker to the lake's edge. I sent a few texts to Jeremy and the others. None of them went through, though. I looked at the island, which was 100 yards away, and focused on the tents. Only two tents were visible, both with stationary lights turned on inside, causing them to glow like fireflies in the dark landscape. I couldn't see any movement, though, but that was not surprising. It was late, and they had all probably gone to bed. As I turned back to my tent, my flashlight caught strange shapes of rocks in the dried-up rapids, like they all had abnormally curved edges. I didn't think much of it, and joined Cat in the tent. When Cat and I woke up the following day, it was still dark out, even though it was past 10 a.m. The storm was growing heavier. We put rain gear on and went to the lake's edge to look out at the island. The storm had caused the water to rise, just a few inches higher, but it was starting to move quickly. The visible tents looked the same on the rock slab. The flashlights were still on in the same positions. No movement. We figured the idiots were probably still drunk or hungover and had no idea what the situation with the storm was. I yelled across to the island, but the rain and thunder covered my voice. Cat and I talked about it and decided to trek across the rocky floor of the lake while we could. We climbed down onto the lake bed, five or six feet below and made our way through the muddy, rocky terrain. As we got closer to the island, I noticed the strange shaped rocks I had seen the night before. There were a lot more than I had previously seen. They seemed to surround the entire island. There were more rows of sharp rocks jutting up and huge pointed boulders with multiple carved and sharp edges. None of them looked naturally eroded and formed by time though. They did show aging, but they didn't look like they had been there forever, if you get what I mean. They looked like they had been sharpened like fish hooks. No wonder kayakers and boaters didn't come this way. As I looked closer, I saw inscriptions carved into the sharper hooked rocks. The carvings were deteriorating, but I could tell they were symbols. Someone, long ago, was responsible for these symbols and hooks. We continued toward the island, narrowly avoiding the sharp rocks and slippery ground. Along the island's edge, we found a portion of stones that opened and gave an entrance. We climbed the rocks and made our way onto the island. The woods were dense and dark, so we decided to move along the side of the island and towards the rock slab and campsite. The storm was starting to get heavier, and boy did it make the climb up hard, but we found our way to the campsite and saw four tents. There was a soggy fire pit, some beer bottles and cigarette butts, loose garbage and foldable chairs, but no people. None of my friends were there. We looked inside all of the tents and everyone's belongings were still there, but they themselves were missing. Cat thought maybe they were in the woods, perhaps even they found a cabin or shack on the interior, something to investigate or ride out the storm in. Then I saw the carvings. The giant slab of stone we were standing on had lines of the same symbols from the hooked rocks on the lake bed. Cat noticed them too and mentioned they looked indigenous. We found a rough pathway into the woods, but the path wasn't more than just trampled grass, shrubs and bushes, and some beer cans and cigarette butts. We followed the trail as it led further into the island's interior. 
The dense trees blocked out the rain from above, and any light the sky gave off was long gone. The interior quickly felt like night, and the sounds of the storm drowned out. All we could hear were the tall, swaying trees overhead as we moved through the mossy, vine-filled woods. The trail of cans and butts ended, and the path disappeared. We thought about turning back, but then we heard something. A whimper. It was coming from somewhere up ahead. It was animalistic. It sounded hurt and afraid, whistling upwards at the end of each whine. I continued forward. Cat followed behind me. On the path ahead, there was a long, nylon-looking rope. We followed it and found it leading us to the source of the whimpering. I realized I wasn't following a string. I was following a leash. Jeremy's pit bull, Oscar, was crouched under an upturned tree, trembling. He had several small slashes across his body. None were profound, but they all looked like they hurt. We approached him calmly and managed to lead him out from under the tree's roots. As we inspected him, it was undeniable that an animal had attacked him. Cat and I whispered to each other, deciding to take Oscar and get off the island and hike back to our car for cell reception. Something terrible had happened. We cut to the right, heading directly for the island's edge, and not back through the woods where we came. Not back to the tents. Then we heard more sounds ahead of us. They were echoing through the dark trees. Cracks, snaps, breaks. It sounded like something was splitting thick tree branches. Oscar started whimpering again and pulled away. Cat took that as a sign and started backing up with Oscar. She motioned for us to go to the opposite side of the island and cross there, but I needed to see what the sounds were. I motioned for her to go ahead and crept towards the cracking trees more. Up ahead, I could see a small clearing in the woods. I peeked into it and saw all the leaves and grass were red. In the center, a hole was dug into the side of a large hill. There were clothes strewn about, all stained with some browning red shade. Then I saw the bodies, if you could call them that. I saw Jeremy first, though it was difficult to tell it was him aside from the bright neon hunting slicker he always wore. His body, just like the others, had been viciously opened and exposed like a fillet. To my left was the source of the sounds. I think one of my friends, Tim, was ripped into pieces. Something was crouched between the two halves of his body. A tall, skinny, vile creature. The beast was all earth tone, greens and blacks and browns. It had tufts, a thick, coarse black hair. It looked like it was sticking out on various parts of its leathery skin. It was solid and robust and clawed through Tim's thighs. The creature pulled out Tim's femur and bit down into it. I looked around at the other bodies and realized they were all missing their bones. The creature didn't eat their skin, their muscle, or fat. It wasn't interested in the meat. It just wanted to eat their bones, which had been torn, pulled, and ripped away from the muscles and ligaments. Even the skulls had been broken apart, and the insides cast aside as the head was devoured. I watched the creature's jaw grind down on Tim's femur. The chewing was horrifying, the breaking, crushing, and pulverizing a bone. Then, the femur snapped, and the familiar crack filled the woods again. A whimper came from the woods behind me, from Oscar. The creature jerked in my direction. I ducked behind a tree before it saw me, but I knew it would be coming. It hurt Oscar. In a low, crouched position, I started rushing through the woods, following the path Cat and Oscar made. But I wasn't quiet as I had hoped, and sticks under my feet began to break, echoing through the trees. A screech roared from the woods behind me. I ran faster, knowing the creature was aware other people were on the island now. It's island. I heard branches breaking and heavy movement behind me as the creature gained on me. Then I started to listen to the storm again. The trees were becoming less dense, and as I was getting to the other side of the island, I saw an opening and rushed for it. I got to the island's edge and was greeted by a raging thunderstorm. The water had risen, and the rapids were back, though they were only half their average height. I looked at the shore and saw that Cat and Oscar had made it across. I climbed down and quickly started trying to make my way to them. The rapids were at my waist and pushing hard. I kept grabbing onto larger rocks for support, but all of their sharpened edges kept cutting my hands. Then Cat screamed. She was staring behind me, at the island. I turned back, only for a moment, and saw the creature climbing down to the lake bed and following me through the growing rapids. The animal was taller than me and moved much faster than I, 
but it had the same problems trying to get footing. I kept going, Cat yelling for me to hurry, the beast behind me gaining. It was only feet away from me now, and its long splintered claws could almost grab my shoulder. It swung at me, narrowly missing. I was still another 20 yards from Cat in the shorefront, and I knew the creature would catch me on the next claw swing down. The only thing I could do was let my legs go from under me. Just before the creature swung down, I let my legs go limp. My body was immediately rushed forward with the rapids, and before I knew it, I was 30 yards downriver. But I slammed into one of the boulders, and a row of sharp rocks dug into my side and ripped through the bicep of my arm. Another, more, poignant and pointier rock put right through my shoulder. It was excruciating, especially with the water pushing me away from the boulder, causing the wounds to open and tear. I heard that horrible screech again and looked up to see the creature had done what I had done. Only the rapids had carried it further to the right. A sharp, long rock was sticking through the creature's abdomen. It had been impaled and was trying to pull itself forward and off, but the hooked edge of the tip was too jagged, and the rapids kept hitting the creature, forcing it back to the hilt. The creature didn't look like it was going to get free, and I realized I'd suffer the same fate if I didn't get loose from the rock I had been snagged on. I managed to pull myself forward and free from the stones lodged in my shoulder and arm. The hooks on the ends tore off a good chunk of skin and meat when I did, but I was free. I slipped, struggled, and fought to the shore where Cat and Oscar were waiting. I rolled both of my ankles and could barely stand up. Cat helped me up, and we looked back at the rapids. The rising water and heavy current were overcoming the creature. We could only see it from the chest, and it was beginning to give up. But when it saw us watching, it got a jolt of energy and was finally attempting to pull itself off the rock. We didn't wait around to see if it did. I did my absolute best to rush Cat and Oscar through the woods, and we found a cottage not too far. We called the police from there, and an extensive investigation started. But ultimately, all that was released to us or the public was a wild animal attack had left several young adults dead on an island they weren't supposed to be on. I still think back to the rocks and boulders surrounding the island, the sharp ones, the one I'd been stuck to and the one the creature died on. Up close, they were all stony fish hooks. I always thought fish hooks were used to catch something to eat, but I was starting to think these were used in the sense of keeping something from trying to escape. Whoever sharpened those rocks, however, they did it and they knew exactly what they were doing. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true and disturbing horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. I'd love to know what story was your favorite in the comments down below. Be sure to subscribe if you're new to the swamp as it helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. Turn on notifications to never miss a new video as I upload them almost every single day. If you're on the go and would like to download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them and listen to them absolutely free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and just about anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online.